We'll now move to our next speaker, uh, who was supposed to be with us yesterday, but he had some issues getting here. Uh, he is Kai Vacher, and he is a principal of the British school Muscat and Salala. Uh, the uh, principal of the British school Muscat and Salala, and he will be talking about growing learners who are best for the world. Kai, over to you. Um, well, uh, thank you for inviting uh, me to be here today and to talk with you a little bit about uh, what we're doing at uh, British School Muscat and Salala. Yeah, sorry I couldn't uh, make it yesterday, but we had a very important visitor. We have got a very important visitor in Muscat in the last couple of days, and uh, we were told we had to send our children home early, and, uh, and that can cause quite a change like that causes a lot of disruption in school so uh, had to manage the early closure so yeah so um, for the last uh, five years at uh, Briscoe Muscat we have been um, thank you we have been thinking not only how do we get our students to do very well in their exams which is obviously very important for them certainly in the short term and most of our students want to go off to universities, not just in the UK, but in the North America, in Amman, in Asia, uh, all over the world our students go to, to university. Uh, but what we're also trying to do at the same time as prepare them for exams and prepare them for university is to prepare them, and we capture this, we call it, who are best for the world. Not in the world, you know, we're not sort of elitist, we are trying to make sure that our students are best for the world. So they make a positive contribution to the world and they can live thriving and fulfilling lives. And uh, this really, for us, is, is a lot about what you're talking about over the, the three days here at the conference, the future skills that these students are going to need in the world. And we, we divide this into thinking skills, so the way that young people are thinking and how we develop different types of thinking but also different types of behaving. So I'm going to come to that. Um, but first of all, uh, where do I point this to? Put it this way, okay. Oh, ah, here we are. Where, over, over there, over those guys, okay. Right, okay. I'm going to get there in a minute. Okay. Get the hang of this now. Obviously, I need a future skill on, uh, on uh, control management here. So, our vision at the British School Muscat, so like all good organisations, we have a vision, an idea of where we're heading for, our journey. And our vision is to provide a world-class British education where everyone, students and staff, are valued, respected and inspired to learn. So that's where we're heading. That's our vision. And our mission, which is chopped off at the bottom here, unfortunately, is to grow students who are best for the world. That's our mission. That's our day-to-day, -day when everybody comes into school, they're thinking, right, how do I grow students who are best for the world? And then we have our values down the left-hand side. These are the values that guide us through our mission and towards our vision, excellence, innovation, kindness, and courage. So those are our values that, that drive us. And then what we've got here are our four priorities. So you shouldn't have more than probably three priorities, but we've got four. And if you have a priority list of 20, you haven't got any priorities, have you? Priority means, you know, what's the most important thing to you? And at the moment, for our development as a school, these are our four priorities. And what I'm going to focus on today is what we call high-performance learning. And within high-performance learning, we think about our learning ethos, which are the ways of behaving, and our thinking skills, which are our ways of thinking. So that's, that is one of our key four priorities as we go forward. Right, so we're on a journey of high-performance learning. We're not experts at it. We've been doing it for about four years. And I'm going to share with you where we've got to in our journey. And it all starts off really with a strong philosophy uh, that I believe in deeply in my heart. And it's, and it's this philosophy here that all of us, all of us, do not have equal talent, but all of us should have equal opportunity to develop those talents. So this was said by a, a president of the United States a few decades ago, 
Uh, and that really summarizes a lot of what we try to do at British School Muscat and Salala. And it is the philosophy behind our approach to teaching and learning. That we believe that every single child in our school has gifts and talents and it is our responsibility to nurture and to grow and to discover those talents. Not that some are gifted and some are not, or some are talented and some are not. So that's the philosophy behind our approach to teaching and learning. And then this is really backed up by what's going on in what we now are calling the learning sciences, what we are learning about the brain, neuroscience. And Professor Deborah Eyre, who I'm going to re reference a few times in this session, Professor Deborah Eyre, she says, and she's worked in education longer than me, probably more than 40 years around the world, and she's done a huge amount of research. And what she is saying now is that the most important development in education in the 21st century is our growing understanding of human capability. So what does she mean by that? Well, what she's referring to is what we are learning about the brain. And what we've been learning about the brain for the last 10, 15, 20 years. You may have heard of Carol Dweck's growth mindset. Well, this isn't just an idea. There's a lot of science that supports it. That the brain and intelligence within the brain is not fixed. That we can grow our own intelligence and we can grow the intelligence of the students in our school. So it's not that you're bright or you're not very bright. You might, not, you, you might be, at the moment, very able in mathematics. You might not be very able in mathematics at the moment, but you can grow. It's like you might not be very fit at the moment, but that doesn't mean you're, you're not fit for the rest of your life. If you spend three months in the gym, you'll get fitter. So if you spend three months three years, three decades, developing certain parts of your brain, you can grow the intelligence in your brain. And there's a very interesting study, for example, for London taxi drivers. You know the black cabs in London? You know, not the Uber cabs, the black cabs, where you go into the, the traditional London taxi, and the, the taxi driver can take you anywhere around London, anywhere. Not with GPS, not with Google Maps, they have the geography, they have the map in their head. And the London taxi drivers have that map in their head because when they become a London taxi driver, they have to do a test. And the test is called the knowledge. And to, to, they have to study maybe three, four, five years for the knowledge, and they have to know every single road and street in London. So when you go to London and you get in a black cab, you can say, take me to Oxford Street they can take you to Oxford Street. Take me to Smith Street, they can take you to Smith Street. They can take you anywhere in London and they don't reference a map because they've learned the map in their head. And what, what this study shows, 2006 study into this London taxi drivers, they studied the brain of the London taxi drivers when they were learning the geography of London. And they found that certain areas of the brain developed and grew as the taxi driver's knowledge of London developed and grew. So this is a really interesting study. You can see it on the internet, 2006 London Taxi Driver Study. Yeah, it's a really good example of as you learn more, elements of your brain grow and develop. So we, we can grow intelligence. So intelligence is not fixed. So, you can think about this experiment called Fleas in the Jar. Now, I don't know if this experiment is true or not. You can watch videos of it on YouTube, uh, and it looks very real, but it doesn't really matter whether it's true or not. It's the message. So, the Fleas in the Jar experiment says that if you put fleas in the jar without a lid on, the fleas jump out of the jar. They jump as high as they can out of the jar. You put the lid on the jar, and obviously the fleas hit their heads against the lid. You take the lid off the jar again, 
And the fleas, they don't jump out of the jar anymore. They've learned to lid, to, to jump as high as the lid, even when the lid's not there. So their environment has restricted their ability to jump. And they've got used, instead of jumping as high as they can, they jump only as high as the lid was there, even when the lid's not there. So you take the lid off, and they don't jump out of the jar anymore. They've learned to be restricted in their achievement. And traditionally, schools can do that to students. You may have experience of being at school and there being a ceiling on the achievement that you think you could get to. I was told at 18 by quite a number of my teachers, Kai, what are you going to do? You can't even talk properly. You should probably go and work in a back office somewhere. I would love to talk to those teachers now and tell them that I'm a leader of a school. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? Two schools. Two schools. And I can stand up here and talk to a, a group of uh, Amani nationals with confidence. You know, I had a very bad stammer when I was 18. And that, that stammer has been with me for m much of my life. But it slowly got better. I've learned to, to manage it. But we could probably all think, if not ourselves, of brothers or sisters or friends where they've been told, you're not creative, you're not good at maths, you're rubbish at sport. And so schools can put this limit, this lid, on achievement of young people if we're not careful. And what we say as teachers and what we say as parents can have a huge impression on our children. So we have to be very careful in schools about not putting a lid on the achievement of young people. Because the science is telling us again and again and again that ability is not fixed. We can grow intelligence. We can grow the gifts that our children have. So, okay, Anders Ericsson, a famous philosopher who passed away recently, he says, talent is grotesquely overrated. This idea that only a few people are talented and those are the people that achieve, that's an overrated concept. What really matters, if you look at people who have been successful, whether it's in sport or business or politics, it's deliberate practice which really makes a difference. Practice makes a huge difference. People aren't born to be perfect violin players. They practice for hours. And it's been some research that you know, 10,000 hours is probably what you need to do. 10,000 hours of practice to get really good at something. I didn't expect that to be there. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, right, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Now, Andreas Schleicher. I wonder how many of you heard of the PISA tests? Have you heard of the PISA tests, the TIMS tests? So there are, there are annual tests. So every few years now, there are tests where country, students in countries all over the world take tests. And we all love a league table, don't we? We like to see the Olympic gold medal table. Where's Oman? Where's the UK? Where's the US? Where's UAE? We like to see a league table. And PISA produces a league table every few years on the education systems in the world. Any of you know which is the current top education system in the world? According to PISA? Well, it was Finland. It was Finland, yeah. And it was been Finland for a while. And currently, it's Estonia. They can actually call it E-Estonia because they're putting such a focus on uh, technology and, and technology skills. So E-Estonia. Um, but Andreas Schleicher, he is the architect behind the PISA League table. So he's been studying education systems around the world for about 20 years now and comparing education systems around the world and looking at data and putting them in league tables. And his, one of his conclusions, one of his strong conclusions, is that we need to move from some students learn at high levels to all students learn at high levels. Wow, that's quite a challenge. But that's the philosophy behind high, high performance learning. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create, a, in our schools, a, an environment where many more children 
perform at the highest level, not just a small percentage. How many of you, how many of you here have you passed your driving test? Right, I won't ask you to put your hand up, but I wonder how many of you passed your driving test first time? And I wonder how many of you, okay, very good, well done, yeah, very good. How many second time? Okay, very good. Third time? Okay, fourth time? Okay. So, so we can all drive well. Yeah, and driving is quite a skill, isn't it? You have to have the technical skill, and you have to, you have, to have the knowledge of the, the road signs and the rules, and you have to drive safely. But not everybody passes first time. But that doesn't mean that once you, if you don't pass first time, you're then a failure. It just takes some people longer than others. And that's how you can think about you know, more young people achieving highly. It doesn't mean they all have to achieve at the same time. It, it could be that some young people need more time than others. Some people might need more support in some areas than others to achieve at high levels. So the driving test is, I mean, my mum, she... She passed the driving test seventh time. And she's a very good driver, still, at 84. But it just took her a bit of a while to get used to it. So, what, uh, so what we're thinking of here then, let's go, ah, here we are. So, how do we then start to get into this idea of more students achieving at high levels? More students achieving at high levels. Well, we focus on two things. As, you know, beyond exams, beyond university, we're also trying to help students how to think and how to behave. And this is, I think, where we perhaps directly come into your, your future skills agenda here. Because what we are talking about here, what we are trying to do day in, day out, not as a separate program, thinking skills. These are the thinking skills that we are trying to grow and develop in all our young people. And you will probably recognize all or most of these thinking skills. These are not unusual. But Professor Deborah Eyre, for 30 years, she worked with gifted and talented programs around the world. You know, looking at the most able, what she thought were the brightest students, and what helped them become really good learners. And her conclusion from three decades of working with gifted and talented students all around the world was that the thinking skills and the ways of behaving of the most able, the highest performing students should be grown and developed in all students. And having spent 30 years or more on gifted and talented programs for a small number of students, she concluded we shouldn't have gifted and talented programs for a small number of students anymore. We can develop these thinking skills in most of our students, not just a small group. And these were the thinking skills which the highest performing students, you know, those who go to Harvard, those who go to Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on, these are the skills that they had. And the learning sciences tell us that we can grow these thinking skills in most or many more of our students. So those are the thinking skills that we are developing every day in our young people within maths, within English, within Arabic, within cultural studies, within history, technology, science. You do it within, not as a separate program. So those are the thinking skills, and then we have the ways of behaving. These are the behaviors that we're trying to encourage in our students. And again, these won't be unusual to you, but these are the behaviors of high-performing learners, the research told us. And the research tells us we can grow these. So I was talking to four students this morning uh, in my office. Uh, they've just been elected head boy, head girl, deputy head boy and deputy head girl of the primary school. So these students are 11 years old. And they come into my office for a chat with the principal so they're all a bit scared. And I said, uh, what do you want to achieve? And they had ambitions as head boy, head girl, deputy head boy, deputy head, what do you want to achieve? I want to make the school where, a, a place where everybody is listened to. I want, the, I want my friends, I want everybody in this primary school to stop being scared about the pandemic. 
We've been through a terrible time for two years. I want to make our, our, my, my, my friends, my, my peers in the school more, much more comfortable, not scared anymore. Okay, so they had these goals about what they wanted to do. Then I said, well, what sort of leader do you want to be? 11-year-olds. What sort of leader? I want to be a collaborative leader. I want to be an open-minded leader, Mr. Vasher. I want to be a listening leader, Mr. Vasher. Ah, I wonder where they got those ideas from. They are talking this language. So what, what does that mean then? You want to be an open-minded leader, Mary, age 11. What does that mean? Well, that means, Mr. Vasher, that I want to listen to lots of different people's viewpoints and understand what their concerns are and then see if we can do something about that to help them. That's an 11-year-old student who understands what open-minded is and can talk to the principal without fear about what she wants to do and what sort of leader she wants to be. That's, that's excellent. Okay, just uh, a lot of people want to ask you questions, okay. so if you can wrap up. And okay. yes, open-minded and listening, this is something very important here. Okay. Thank you. So, so we've got those ways of thinking, those ways of behaving, which we're trying to develop every day. And then that obviously means that our teachers need to behave differently. And so really, just to finish off, you may well have heard the seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey, a world bestseller. Uh, the seven habits of a highly effective teacher in our school, these are the habits the teachers are trying to grow so that they can help develop those skills in the students. And the most important thing and the starting point is the mindset. And we'll just finish with a final slide. Not that one. We keep going. Okay, this is high performance learning, Deborah Ayer. And the mindset shift, and that's the most difficult piece in this, is the mindset shift that we need our students and our teachers to believe that they are braver and stronger and smarter than they actually think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kay. And it's wonderful to have school, heads of schools with us talking to the government, talking to the corporate, and talking to the university academic leaders. So I think here we want to take uh, advantage of you being here and ask a few questions. Okay. If anybody has any questions to Kay Vacher, he's the head of British School for Musket and Salala, and having heard what his um, uh, personal difficulties where and having reached where he is. If you have any questions, please go ahead and raise your hands and we'll pass the mic on to you. Hi Kai, thank you very much. I, I have a question regarding, um, you, you spoke a lot about these skills that we need for the future, starting from schools, and of course we know British School uh, in Oman is one of the top schools here. Is there a type of um, forum or committee or communication with other schools in Oman where uh, people, heads of schools are discussing and seeing how we can kind of come to a common ground and start to implement this across most schools in Oman because like you mentioned equal opportunity, um, everyone has their own path. How can we get more schools in Oman to um, be doing something similar to you guys? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a good question, thank you. Um, so uh, we, we meet on um, a weekly basis with uh, 12 other principals of international schools. Uh, in Muscat and one down in Slala and one up in Sohar. So we do have a, a weekly meeting uh, where, we, where we share issues. Um, but yeah, so I, I would love to work more with the government schools and the private schools in Oman. And I'm uh, meeting uh, Miss Seaham tomorrow at the International Schools Office. She's the Director of International Education. She was just appointed in uh, July 2021. Uh, and we're starting to develop a great relationship with Miss Seaham. And uh, Ms. Siam has asked me and invited me to respond to uh, the Oman Vision 2040 uh, paper, which sets out obviously the, you know, the vision for Oman over the next uh, 15 to 20 years. And I've drafted uh, a paper for Ms. Siam, which we're going to dis discuss uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And uh, I, I, would, I would love to be able to uh, work with and support and also learn from uh, other, other schools across the Sultanate. And I've got a number of ideas in the paper, uh, which I'll be discussing with, with Ms. Siham tomorrow. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, I just want to add to that. Uh, yes, that's wonderful that you're going to work with Siham on the Ministry of Education to do this. And you mentioned that there are about 14 or 15 schools which meet on a regular basis. Uh, I'm not sure how confidential this information is. There are other schools who want to be working together. Mm -hmm. And uh, yesterday, Dr. Abdullah announced like an advisory, uh, which is an intergovernmental, inter-academic and corporate advisory to work on not just the vision 2040, because that is one part. Mm -hmm. And sometimes here we look like a fragmented approach to a, a larger solution. Here, yesterday in the morning, we spoke about the future skills framework. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to share the documents with you. Okay. It's in English and Arabic, and also about the study in Oman, which was just launched in Dubai at the Expo 2020. And as your country has done study in UK, and it's like one of the leading in the world, um, you know, and then again, with UK, it's a study in Scotland where I went and studied. So it's like so, so competitive. Oman is trying to do that, and it's just the first step. Mm. So we want to see how we can get schools to collaborate on this advisory, and I think that's going to help on a larger scale. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. And the other bit uh, uh, that I I've, I've can mention is that uh, we, we've had the, the, the Ministry of Education in, in the last uh, couple of months, because we also do a lot of work on uh, technical and vocational education. Uh, with music, with uh, physical education, with design and technology, with business, and a whole range of technical subjects. And uh, we, we've had the Ministry of Education in, in the last two months looking what we're doing, and they also write a paper based on that to, to share with the committee that's looking into technical and vocational in Oman too. So we, 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 we're doing quite a bit to support education sultanate, and we're very happy to, to do whatever we can do further. And certainly, um, collaboration with other schools, we'd be very, very happy to explore ideas about how we might do that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if Kemi, Kemi Lumke is in this hall with us. But, uh, but we, no. she, Kemi's in my, my group, ah, in our group. Oh, okay, okay, and okay. Uh, Kemi and I are meeting on a regular basis. Okay, yeah, okay. We, we know each other very well. Sure. So do we have any more questions before we can request you all to bring lunch in and then we can have another speaker while we have lunch? I think there are no more questions. Um, thank you so much, Kay, for coming over and uh, really appreciate that you're working with a lot of schools and we want to add more schools to it because we have the higher education event for 20 years and we focused on higher education mm -hmm. and technical education and skills now. And we are also looking at working closely with schools on all our initiatives on technology and education. And it'll be wonderful to, to collaborate. There's one last question before we can go for lunch. And, yeah, if you don't mind, I would like to know your perspectives on how do you look at school as a leader uh, where there are a lot of options for students these days. They think that there is no longer a full-time school. They have to go to make a career. So how do you look at uh, uh, this from your perspective? The reason I'm asking this is uh, when I went to school, uh, my parents told me you have to go to a full-time school to make it something in your life. But these days, the options are very more. Uh, uh, the students and then the people around, they have a lot of pressure in terms of, you don't need to go to a full-time school. There's online education, there are several other kinds of education to actually make a, a good stamp in the society or whatever in terms of making money. How do you look at it uh, uh, from that standpoint? Well, I think, yeah, I, th I think, I, think I, I understand your question. Um, I might, I might be uh, cheeky and, and maybe respond to that with a, a different que a, a question related to that. So lots of our parents, when the children come to maybe age 10, 11, 12, they're thinking, what secondary school do I go to? This is a big decision when they've been at elementary or, or primary school. And they think, you know, what is the right school for my child? I think the pandemic has accelerated educational innovation um, quite substantially. Uh, and I, th I, I think what parents may be needing to ask themselves now, not what is the right school for my child, but what is the right education for my child. And education, you could argue, doesn't always have to be in school. You could argue that. I mean, I'm sure many of us have learned probably at least as much since we left school as when we were at school. 
And so there are, there are increasingly opportunities yeah, to learn online, to learn from other people. In some countries like the US and the UK, there's a growing amount of children who are learning at home or learning at home for part of the time. And so I, said, I think the question is, it's, I think more than ever, there is a huge need for education. But I, th I think the question could be, what is the right education for young people and maybe edu education doesn't just have to be in school. School is a great place for education, but for some children it isn't, or not for th throughout their career, it's not always the right place for them. So I, th I, th I think the question going forward is, what is the right education for my child, maybe as opposed to what is the right school for my child. But school will, for many children, continue to play a big part in their education, but maybe not for everybody. Thank you so much, Kay. It's wonderful. If you're going to stay with us for lunch, maybe more people will approach you to ask. And this is a very delicate relationship between school, university, and the job, and the fear in between of the technology moving fast. So a lot of uh, contribution was there from school heads and people concerned. And we want to start to work with schools so that the skill gap is not that big. At least we can try to kind of you know, right. make it close. Thank you so much Fantastic. and wonderful. Enjoy your lunch, uh, you. ladies and gentlemen. And we'll come back with the lunch. The lunch buffet is outside, so you can just bring your food, come inside. You can go and come in and have your lunch while we have another speaker on the presentation so we can pay attention to what he has to say. He's joining us from the United Arab Emirates. Um, He's an expert. He supported the UAE government on the transport uh, sector. So it'll be very useful to listen to him. Thank you so much.